hello to you all uh, and a genuinely warm welcome uh, as the UK weather is finally realising that we are in the summer season after all. Uh, my name is James Ward and I run the banks and transaction services business here at NatWest. Um, I'm delighted to be opening this, the second session uh, from our Banks 45 webinar series, uh, featuring the today, uh, featuring the views and insights uh, of our panel of senior leaders across the UK payments ecosystem. Uh, before I hand over for the session to begin, um, I'd just like to acknowledge our Middle East and our Asia uh, partner banks for whom this time zone uh, may be challenging to see this live. Um, however, I am pleased to say that for, for you and indeed for other colleagues and clients uh, who are unable to make this in, in live, uh, we will be doing a post event recording and we'll be sharing that link uh, as well as a feedback form uh, if you'd be kind enough to fill in to confirm uh, your views um, and also to be able to share more broadly. Um, so without further ado, I, I will get out of the way as I'm very, very keen myself to hear the views of our, of our panel today. And I will be handing over to our moderator, Nick Kerrigan. Nick, over to you, please. Thanks, James. And hello, everyone. My name is Nick Kerrigan, Head of Innovation Execution at SWIFT, the world's leading provider of financial messaging services. I'm delighted to be moderating today's session with this stellar group of panellists, focusing on payments transforming for a future fit digital ecosystem. The format for today's session will include introductions to the panelists and they will focus on the key themes that matter to NatWest's clients. We will then have the opportunity for clients to participate in Q&A after the key speaking sessions. So if you'd like to submit any questions, please do so using the Q&A function in Zoom or raise your hand when we get to that section. So why are we here today? Well, payments are now recognized as the heartbeat of a bank. Making a payment is the one thing that every customer does. Payments offer a gateway to improving customers' lives, enabling money to flow, people to thrive, and at a time when it's more important than ever, they are a key driver and enabler of economic growth. But as we know, the world is in a period of digital transformation. What is driving this change and how is the payments community rising to the challenges and opportunities? To answer these questions and more, I am joined today by Marion King, Director of Payments at NatWest, Gerard Limos, Independent Chair of the UK Finance's Payments, Products and Services Board, and Tony Craddock, Director General of the Emerging Payments Association. So let me hand over to Marion to introduce us, herself and to get this discussion going. Marion, the stage is yours. Thanks very much, Nick, and, and thanks for the introduction. So my name is Marion King. I'm Director of Payments at NatWest and I've been at the bank now six years. Um, I joined the payments industry coming up 20 years ago as the CEO of Vocalink. Um, and through my nine-year tenure there, we designed and built and launched the fast payment system, the real-time interbank payment system, some 13 years ago. Um, after Vocalink, I moved to MasterCard to experience and understand the cards market, and I was president of MasterCard for UK and Ireland and the region and part of the um, European um, executive group and then came to NatWest in 2015. And my role really is all really what Nick was saying in terms of future-proofing and being future-ready. So I, I have a responsibility around strategy for payments bank-wide, um, resilience, the day-to-day -day operations to make sure that we are always safe and secure for our customers. Um, um, regulatory compliance, it's my responsibility to ensure that we provide fully compliant services and that we maintain compliance and that we build the relationships with the regulators. Uh, market development, we work with all the scheme companies um, and all of the influencing bodies across the industry, two of which uh, my colleagues are on the panel today. Um, and more importantly, perhaps I'm responsible for the technology and the technology that enables all of our customers to transact um, in the way that they wish. And, and it's really that point of customers and that point that Nick was saying in terms of it's something all of our customers do every day that is the key driver of what's happening in the payments world right now. Payments expect more um, and they expect it in real time. And 
we the title of, the, of this webinar is about a digital age and NatWest is a relationship bank in a digital age. And really interesting that NatWest, we process about 25% of all payment flows through the UK, electronic payment flows. We are seeing about 72% of customers using online banking. We know that a third of all customers across the UK um, use mobile banking, which is interesting. And last year, 90, about 90% of all adults made at least one transaction online. And we saw, as we all know, a real acceleration of that shift to digital um, through the pandemic as getting out and about was really difficult. So digital is here, it's very embedded, it's significant, and we keep moving forward with that technical capability. That's the second driver, it's the technology that enables that customer need. And we're seeing um, a massive shift to digital. That means thinking about things like capacity, uh, limits, uh, real-time monitoring, all the things that you need to facilitate that massive growth in the transaction base and, and taking it a few steps further. And uh, no doubt, Tony and Gerard will talk about this, but looking at it industry-wide, using digital capability to establish digital identity, to, to really join together to beat the real enemy in the payments world, and that's the fraudster. And we are seeing fraud cases rise, certainly in the UK and elsewhere in the globe. And then through that technology, we're looking at modernity, we're looking at open banking, we provide open banking banking and API suites for our customers. I, I think open banking has a long way to go in terms of usage. We saw about 4 million transacted last year uh, through open banking, which was a good uptick from 2018 of about 320,000. So gradually it's increasing and growing and we need to prepare for that. Similarly, with cryptocurrencies, central bank digital currencies, the potential of utilising distributed ledger technology for clearing and settlement. So all of these future capabilities aren't something we think about tomorrow. We're planning today to ensure that they're in place as and when our customers um, have a demand and, and need and can benefit um, from services that they will bring. Um, I, I guess the third key driver in the payments industry, and we're all seeing it, is regulation. I like to view leg regulation as a kite mark, uh, as a place to, a, a way of saying that our systems are protected, they're safe and secure, um, and that regulation plays a critical role in keeping the balance in that ecosystem. Because many of these demands of simplicity, speed, safety, certainty and smart, so data with your payment, many of those are conflicting. So whilst we want real-time payments, we want them to be safe. To make them safer, you need to put friction in the process. If you put friction in, it slows it down. So we have to think about all of these tensions um, that our customers need and want, utilize technology to facilitate it, ensure that that regulatory um, compliance and opportunity is there, as well as planning for future regulation with ISO 20022 being a global standard, which again will allow interoperability, will allow strength of globalization and cross-border payments. So lots happening, three key areas. We're here to meet customer demand, um, manage that compliance and ensure that we're looking at and working with the best technologies to ensure that NatWest payments are safe and secure and future-proofed. Thank you, Marion. Um, and as you know, we're as uh, passionate about ISO 200022 uh, as, as you are. Um, and it's fascinating to hear about those, those three key drivers, the customers, technology and regulation. Let's now go then to, to Tony. So, so maybe taking those drivers, Tony, how do you see them playing out through the technology of payments and also how we see uh, some of those drivers kind of affecting payments trends internationally. But thank you, Nick, uh, for that uh, introduction. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I, as the Director General of the Emerging Payments Association, I'm often here representing the voice of the industry, 150 plus members, 200 plus members across the EPA in the UK, EU and, and Asia. Today I'm being asked really to be more like the eyes of what are we seeing? What are we seeing out there? Because when you hear Marion talk about uh, the, the goal, which is, you know, we'd love to have it all. Simple, safe, 
beady, smart, certain and frictionless payments sound so easy when you say them in a single sentence, but it's really not that easy as, as many new entrants and quite a few established players have found not only in developing markets, but also those that might be described in payments terms as more advanced. And, and what we're seeing in the UK, across Europe and in Asia, uh, and more globally, is evidence of the underlying tensions, the tensions that exist in a market that has those three drivers of customers, technology and regulation that Nick and Marion have just mentioned. We're, we're seeing more investment in payments, but more companies not realizing their potential. We're seeing new products and innovation, but more fraud. And these dichotomies, this, this tension, I think, uh, is, is caused by, by two things, the yin and the yang, things that we experience every day. And I, what I'd like to do is just highlight a few of them for you and, and see what you can imagine this means in terms of how the market's playing out uh, around the world. We want fast and we want slow. So yes, we want near instant for some transactions, but I really don't want to buy a house with a contactless payment from my phone, for example. We want easy and we want secure. So I want the convenience of paying with my wearable device, my ring or my phone, but I want no risk at all that it can be scammed. Um, I want old and established and secure, but I want new and exciting. So I may have invested as a company in established inc infrastructure that I want to have capitalized upon, but I want to have the capabilities to give me a competitive edge in the market as well. So let's go through a couple more. I want commercial profit, but I also want to be enlightened. In other words, I want to make money, but I also want to make a difference. Another tension is I want to be national and local, but I also want to be international. In other words, I want to promote the interests of my country, but I also want to champion the industry globally. I certainly want to export around the world. These tensions are creating uh, the underlying dynamics behind our industry. Uh, strangely enough, after the pandemic, I want to have the convenience of meeting remotely, but I want the confidence of meeting in person. Some cultures still prefer the former and others are uncomfortable with the COVID risk affecting our security uh, in person. We want paper and digital because we can see and feel, but we want, um, uh, sorry, we want paper or did cash and checks, but we also want digital, which is about mobile payments. We want a convenient digital identity and we want privacy. And it's a very long list. There's lots of different things to do with public sector and private sector, scheme rails and bank rails. And I think the secret to going through this conversation is understanding living with and maybe even embracing these tensions. Uh, the tension results in creativity, innovation, new ideas, new products and services, with, which ultimately will result in payments that better serve users everywhere. Personally, I believe it's what makes the payments industry totally enthralling. The opportunities are phenomenal, but the risks are there too. That's another tension. We have to learn to live with fraud. Sorry, we have to learn to live with fraud. And we have to live with COVID. We have to learn to live with money laundering. We have to learn to live with uh, uncertain and slow payments, complexity, risk, and cost. And the challenge for the next five years is to get the right balance between Marion's underlying drivers of customers, technology and regulation, so that we get the right amount paid to the right people in the right way at the right time and the right cost. I believe it's what makes payments so phenomenally exciting and so much fun. Thank you, Tony. And, um, you know, as, as, a, as a practitioner in this space, I couldn't agree with you more. It, you know, the, the creativity that these tensions unleash is then, you know, expressed in innovation. And that's what obviously gets us all excited as, as payments kind of practitioners um, in this space. Um, so, so, Jared, I mean, you've got a unique perspective here um, in your role at, at UK Finance. Um, I wonder if do you see the, the, the world changing in the way that, you know, that, that Tony talks about the, the picture that, that he paints? And in particular, I guess I'm curious to know, how do you see um, industry and government kind of responding in, in a UK context to some of these uh, these changes? Yes, th thanks, Nick. I mean, these kind of sessions are more fun if your panelists disagree, aren't they? But, uh, but actually, <laughs> of I, course. I agree with a lot of what what um, Marion and Tony have said. But I want to pick out some some different themes to the to the ones that they picked out, perhaps. Uh, I, I mean, uh, so uh, 
a lot of the participants on this call are uh, not based in the UK, and they don't need me to remind them that, you know, the UK is a very big economy, uh, and it's a very trade-focused economy, and it's very outward-looking, uh, and it uh, has a, an international reputation for being well-regulated, um, but also being innovative. And all those things, all those characteristics of what's good about doing business in the UK apply in payments, I would say. Um, uh, and and that, that's why it's interesting to do it. Um, at UK Finance, um, we, we represent all the product lines uh, across, across industry, you know, mortgages and retail banking and um, wholesale banking and all the rest of it. But we do have a, a big and active role in the payment space. And that's really for a, a very specific reason, which applies perhaps to payments than it does uh, to other banking products, which is the payments is a network industry. Uh, it's not, it's, yes, the UK is a very competitive financial services market, but there are some things and payments is one of them where you have to operate to some degree as a network. And that means operating collaboratively. And my job as, uh, as an independent, leader in uh, UK finance of the payments operation is is to um, harness that collaboration uh, to achieve you know innovation at, at the network level so it can't always be ubiquitous but but obviously we would we want as far as possible to uh, for and, and if you're the government or um, the regulators you certainly don't you don't want a sort of two-speed sector where some people are much safer and much more compliant and others are not on the other hand you do want new entrants coming in challenges coming in and so on so, so there are some circles to be squared there and, I, and I've been doing I've been working in this collaborative innovation space for you know more than a decade now in payments and uh, the thing I've learned I think which is the most important thing I think for the, for the people on this call is that Technology is almost never the limitation. Uh, it, what is generally the limitation is our ability to work together and harness network benefits effectively because there are all kinds of complex um, uh, interdependencies and competitive tensions and not to mention human nature, which in my experience is not always a driver of innovation. Um, so, uh, you know, my job is, 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 is to move that collaborative innovation agenda forward. And I rely very much on uh, banks like NatWest to, to help with that and people like Marion to help with that. Um, and sometimes they have to do things which are in the interest of the industry where they may have a, perhaps a competitive advantage, you know, which points in a slightly different direction. So, you know, NatWest is, is a fantastic participant and uh, partner in our efforts and uh, in the collaborative innovation space. And there are lots of examples that I, I could pick out, but they, the, the examples that, you know, I would pick out all point to the, to the priorities that Marion and Tony were mentioning. So, for example, we've introduced, we are, you know, well down the road of introducing confirmation of pay, which is designed to make things safer for customers. Uh, and give customers more control and, and more choice. And that's happening across the industry, you know, and that requires uh, direct participants in the payment systems like NatWest to work with the indirect participants. And, you know, people have to collaborate, otherwise you simply don't get the benefits of, 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 of ubiquity or the network. Um, but all that said, I think the thing we realised, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I suppose, was that, you know, payments is probably the most disrupted space in banking at the moment. Um, uh, uh, the disruption in other, other markets, credit and so on, ha has already happened. It, it's, it's where there's an enormous amount going on. So we decided to try and cast our mind forward uh, over 10 years. And Marion was closely involved in working with us on um, thinking about what, the, what, what making the UK future ready for payments in 2030 would look like. Um, and, and she led that work and we're, we're very grateful for, to her for doing that. Um, and a number of things came out of it. I won't repeat them, I won't repeat them all now because there are a hundred and something recommendations. There's two versions of the, of the report that we produce available online. You can download them. Um, one's short for your less diligent colleagues and one's the full version for, for all the people on this call. Um, but the, uh, uh, two or three things I'd pick out from, from that conversation, which seemed to me to be pointers for the future. I mean, Marion's already highlighted moves in the digital ID space. This is clearly something 
where where we are making progress and need to make progress it it, it makes a huge difference in e-commerce it 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 really moves the attrition problem forward uh, and it's very it's a very important thing for us and and there are lots of things going on competitively but as i say uh, the industry wants to see something that perhaps doesn't reach every corner but but is interoperable across very large sect very large parts of the sector and that's also what the government wants for for, for good and obvious reasons because there are enormous public policy benefits here uh, in, in particularly in, in crime but also in other areas in in health and so on and uh, a really well functioning digital id system will give us the opportunity to really harness the benefits of behavioral economics which we haven't done quite quite as much as we could yet so i would pick that out I do think the future for for the payments rails is interoperability. I think this is really a really important point. We've got we've got uh, uh, interbank payments operating on one set of message standards, on one set of uh, approaches, and cards operating on another. I don't think that will be the picture in ten years' time. I think ISO twenty o two two changes that. But generally, uh, the, you know, the trend in the technology with APIs and open banking and so on is to create a much more porous set of transactions across those rails and therefore to give customers more choices and merchants more choices and that's great and that'll create competitive pressure for you all both to be more uh, be faster to be safer better value for money and so on and, and that's very good what what iso 22022 and this is the third thing i'd highlight i think will point to is that we have a common message standards across several different types of payments rails and the opportunities, the economic opportunities that are created by having that huge data lake in our industry are enormous. Uh, and 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 we we in the UK will, will, will be at the very forefront of, of those changes. And one of the pieces of work we're doing at UK Finance, the thing that will facilitate the, the um, the use of all that data in, a, in an economic way, but also to drive social and public policy, will, will be much more closer collaboration o- over payment standards. And this is a really important emerging agenda for us. So I'll stop there, Nick, and you know, uh, delegates may want to, want to pick up on some of those points, but those are some of the big things that seem to me to be emerging for the next 10 years. Wow, Gerard. I mean, there's there's so much there. I, I suspect we could have this conversation all afternoon and all evening on those topics. I mean, collaborative innovation and unlocking the power of the network is obviously is, is a is a huge one. Digital ideas you mentioned, and then the interoperability and opportunities created by ISO around around data um, are all are all massive and and very clearly very important topics. So I guess I mean, with so much going on. I mean, Marion, maybe we could go go back to you and maybe you could tell us a bit about, you know, how NatWest is responding to some of those kind of challenges and, and also, you know, embracing the payments transformation, both, I guess, in the bank and for your clients. Yeah, thanks, Nick. And, and perhaps building on some of those big themes, it, it, I think the key thing that comes out of this that in my role, that I must do everything in, you know, for our customers and for this bank. But at the same time, we play a very significant role in the industry. And, and that's really the UK industry, but in globalization and with the drive for interoperability, we're part of the global ecosystem. So there's always that for the bank, for our customers, real focus and then there's that bigger picture because we're such a key part of that ecosystem so what we're doing now I'll just give you some a flavor of some of the things we've, we've done in the last year to recognize the world that we've been in and the world that we're moving to so if we talk about um, faster payments you know which when I was at Vocalink was launched some 13 years ago and every year on year we see capacity increase as customers need that real-time interchange. And to Gerard's point, we're going to see real-time interbank rails, both here and internationally, and potentially joining up to be an alternative to card rails um, so that we start to get more global competition and cross-border competition. So those are things coming soon. But in preparation for that, we significantly increase the capacity 
for processing for faster payment. We increased the transaction limit to £250,000. Um, and there's probably more to come in that arena. But again, we have to look at the tensions of fraud and safety. We work very closely through the pandemic with DWP to ensure that universal credit and all the payments required for uh, citizens in the UK were distributed effectively and quickly and manage that in real time because uh, we bank the DWP for all of those payments. Similarly with HMRC, under a lot of pressure to issue loans and grants to those organisations across the UK that were was, was stricken through their businesses by COVID and, and, and needed that money and they needed it quickly. So what we were able to do was provide HMRC with a partner a confirmation of payee in a white label approach. We, 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 we stood all this up in days, not weeks, um, to enable them to verify that the grant was going to the organization that applied for it. Because clearly when you stand up distribution mechanisms like this quickly, fraud is a real issue. And we were able to provide that through the work that we done pan industry in creating that confirmation of payee where you, you you have verification of the name of the account to the individual, to the company, as well as the bank account number and sort code. So that was a really good example of using technology, thinking through customer demand, reacting quickly and being able to do it and provide it at scale. And it, and it was successfully applied and really helped the, the swift distribution of funds throughout the UK. Moving in that direction, and, and, and I'm not just saying this because Nick is kindly hosting us today and facilitating, but we're meeting now and moving through our milestones to uh, utilise Swift GPI to provide transparent and trackable cross-border payments. This whole concept of open architecture and being able to connect and move forward. But again, we're doing all of this, but we have to do it and be mindful of, of protection all the way through. And I think coming soon, and we, we heard Gerard talk about ISO 2022. This is really significant. Um, it's not just one scheme, it's every scheme. So we start in the UK with CHAPS, which is the real-time gross settlement system um, to be ready for next year for ISO readiness. So through my teams, we do this once so that it's there for all schemes as they move across with, with target to the following year. Um, ultimately faster payments when new payments architecture lands. And what this means is we literally through the organization and through our customers, we data map so that that rich data field with that ISO messaging standard can provide meaningful insights and information for our customers uh, to use to, to enable and speed up and, and facilitate their, their in-business processes. Um, so that's all coming through and that work is, is a major um, activity as we sit here. Um, then building out our API suite, strengthening that API suite um, to provide transaction and reporting APIs. This will be offered to Bankline Direct customers um, with a, a robust sort of API channel for checking balances and information at scale to help organizations in their in-house processing validation and managing transaction flows and reconciliation. Um, we're working very strongly on our foreign exchange um, capability and our cross-border capability. Again, recognizing that globalization is, is really impacting payments and payments is a network industry, not just within geographical boundaries. And it's, you know, hitherto, I think one of the key issues with payment flows, it is still difficult or, or lengthy to move money cross border. Um, and again, to speed that up and do it with, with great data flows and keep it safe and watch out for anti-money laundering and all of those other things that we have to do around the regulatory requirements is, is a big task, but it's underway. And so all of these things will be flowing through um, to our customers. Um, in the coming months. And I mean, as an organization, we've provided the indirect access service to other financial institutions for over 20 years now. So lots of experience in managing and ensuring access to all of the payment schemes, not just here in the UK, but the SEPA um, CT and direct debit schemes as well, and settlement schemes such as CREST, CLS and LIPS. So ensuring that 
your needs are met um, and working with you and with your requirements to embrace those elements of modernity and new technology that we've spoken about, uh, but at the same time, those tensions in terms of, of making sure that whether it's a single payment, um, a recurring payment, a push payment, a pull payment, a domestic payment, a cross-border payment, an instant requirement or a bulk requirement, that we can provide that, that facility in resilient and, and safe environment. So lots more coming. Um, I continue to work hard to modernize our estate, you, driving that digital agenda, moving to cloud storage and distribution, moving our technology to simplify. If we simplify, we can become more efficient and we can move more quickly. And the, and the challenge is always in the transition. You know, it's not designing what you want and what you need. It's how do you move from where you are to what you need to provide and doing it carefully to make sure that our day-to-day -day business runs effectively. Because re really for me, whilst I, I totally agree with Tony, and I'm sure we'll disagree on something in the question session, but, you know, payments is exciting and fun. And, and with Jared, it's ubiquitous and it's global and new standards and new mechanisms are coming together. And the biggest shift for me this year has been how the industry is pulling together and how we share and we learn, sharing data on fraud um, instances, sharing data on how to be more secure, because these things shouldn't be a competitive sport. We should all aspire to achieve the best um, to, to, to ensure that one thing that, that I really, you know, hold dear to my heart is that our customers trust working with NatWest. They are confident that their payment flows will be certain, will be safe, uh, will be secure, etc., cetera, um, and, and that they trust working with us um, no matter how many changes and new things we bring to market. Uh, and I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. I mean, that's that's fantastic. And it's great to see how NatWest is is modernizing and driving uh, the, 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 the payments agenda. And obviously, from a SWIFT perspective, we're delighted to part with, uh, with you on, on, on the GPI service. Uh, conscious of time, let's move over to the Q&A uh, session uh, now. Um, we've got a couple of pre-submitted questions, and there are also questions that have come through on, on the Zoom. So thank you to those who've posted them. Um, I think we'll start off with the pre-submitted ones and go uh, to a question that we've had in uh, about instant payments, uh, which obviously is a really high sort of, uh, you know, top of mind kind of topic. So what are the most significant risks and opportunities of instant payments and, and how are these amplified when they become cross-border transactions? Maybe, Tony, I'll go first to you on that and then allow uh, Gerald and Marion to maybe follow up if, if they'd like to. For every thank you. So for every uh, country uh, or jurisdiction that's created a, an instant payments uh, architecture, and, and Marion, of course, has initiated the UK's 13 years ago. It seems like yesterday, but there you go. Um, is is you know once you've set it up in one country, it's straightforward. Internationally, it's a complete spaghetti jungle of of uh, of risk and uncertainty. And and again, this is where the the relationship. Uh, with the 10,000 plus banks that, that um, uh, SWIFT uh, has with its members is, is so important, so powerful. Um, but it's only part of it because it's every, every, for every um, end point is attached to some degree of risk and uncertainty. And, and the Emerging Payment Association works with organizations up and down the value chain. Our purpose is to be the bridge. And, and so we have some very small organizations or relatively small compared to uh, NatWest and, and SWIFT who are themselves uh, helping to solve problems, for example, around uh, taking people who are financially included, in, excluded, who wish to um, who wish to send cash back home to a country like uh, Nepal or Somalia or um, or Pakistan from wherever they're they're living now, um, and they 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 want to do it with cash. It's legitimately earned money. Um, but the chain of events that's necessary to take that to a small shop, put it into a, into a bag, take it to a cash distributor, bank it, send it through the correspondent network and out to the other end. There's so many potential points of failure there 
that the system, I mean, I think it's wonderful that it works at all, to be honest with you. It does generally work most of the time very well, but there are both holes in the bucket and uh, there are some components of that that are, are, that, are neither, that are either slow, expensive, inaccessible, or, um, or uh, um, closed. And, and so that's why the G20 roadmap on cross-border payments is such a powerful and important global initiative kicked off by the uh, G20, facilitated by the FSB, uh, enabled by a, a range of organizations. We partnered with the Bank of England on a workshop the other day to, to address exactly what targets are reasonable in the next three to five years. This is a sort of collaboration that Marion's referring to. I think it's wonderful. I urge everybody on who's listening in now to step forward and be part of this sort of a group to collaborate. We collectively improve the ecosystem and as a result, drive more safety, security and benefit to everyone, not just the ones with the money, but the ones perhaps who don't have access to it. Great. Thank you, Tony. Um, Gerard or Marion, any brief comments you just want to make about instant payments? Yeah, just just uh, quickly, Nick. I mean, the, the first thing to say, you know, which which is so obvious, it hardly needs saying, is that instance payments are wonderful, right? I mean, this is a completely transformation in human experience, <laughs> you know, being able to move, you know, it's an amazing thing that has, has happened, really. You just have to step back. We take it for granted now, particularly in the UK, because, you know, we kind of started it. But it is a tremendous thing. But the question was, uh, and it's very liberating. It's very liberating, as Tony says, for people who don't have that much money to know where it is and what's going on and not feel that things are lost in the system and that they're being ripped off and so on. It, it is, you know, we have to hold on to what a big social good instant payments are. But the question was about risk. And obviously, you know, the obvious one to call out is the, is the fraud risk. And Tony talks about the number of links in the chain, particularly when you go cross border. And I'm not an expert on fraud, but even I know that the more links in the chain there are, the more opportunities there are for fraud. And, you know, we just have to get better at that. And I think it links to my other point, which is that, you know, Marion and I both highlighted that the, cho the greater choices that consumers, end users, I mean, end consumers, not, not interbank clients, will have in this new universe of instant payments and interoperable rails and so on. And, I, you know, I'm sorry to say, I, I know this is a sort of um, rather uh, impolite thing to observe, but, you know, more consumer choice means more consumer mistakes. And that means perhaps honestly made mistakes as well as fraudulent mistakes. And there'll be lots of questions. There already are lots of questions for banks about liability and responsibility in that space. And we just have to get and those are collaborative problems with collaborative solutions. We have to get better because at that and it gets more complex in the cross-border environment you know a cross-border kyc that's a big one isn't it you know so there, there are all sorts of real challenges where we have to work we have if we really want to harness the benefit that particularly international instant payments uh, it allow us to have we really do have to get better at cracking some of these problems and i have to say you know consumer education is a good thing i've worked in that space myself i was chairman of the money advice service but in the end, the way you reduce these problems is by innovation in the products. You, you mm. cannot say as banks, we don't get the customers we deserve. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Um, I, I, I wanted to squeeze in maybe uh, coming to Marion, um, a, further, a further question that sort of, uh, that kind of builds on this, um, which is, which is coming on the Zoom, which is how do we ensure we develop an inclusive payment service for all users? Um, and I think that's very closely linked to the points Gerard was just making, Marion. Yeah, and, and again, this is one of the tensions when we talk digital. When digital doesn't work for everyone, and it's really important that we leave no one behind. So, you know, that does mean keeping cash, clearly, keeping checks in the UK um, for as long as people need them, but doing what we can to streamline that, automate it and make it fraud free. So image capture of checks in the UK has helped a lot of people because they can send their checks in using a smartphone, but if they don't have a smartphone, they can get them delivered to the branch. So you've got that either or, and, and the physical medium is still there, will still be processed and will still be managed. As we go forward, what we're trying to do is develop and utilizing those real-time rails to enable 
um, you know, telephone payments and other payments that can be done safely and securely. The reason checks exist is because you want to send a payment and you don't know their bank details, and nor should you. Um, and so we are utilising telephone, audio, branch networks, physical capability to ensure that transition happens. Um, and I think that collaboration goes beyond just the payments industry and the financial services industry. I think there needs to be collaboration with the non-for-profit sector who are working on digital inclusion, on telcos, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, noticing one of the big networks offering buy one, give one. So trying to get capabilities out to people that don't have smartphones, but we must always remember there will be some that do not have the capacity to use it, even if it's given to them. And so mm-hmm. we have to do both, you know, we have yeah. to do both and, and we, that's enduring, that's life. You know, you cannot leave any part of the community behind. Um, and therefore, you know, I'm sort of promoting this, others are in the industry, no one has the single answer. It does mean organizations coming together and to help that education as well, what's available, how do you access it, what 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 and how does it work for you? Um, and so all of that continues as as well as things for you know the, the visually impaired or, or hearing impaired or, or other key things that might limit people's access to our payment systems. So a lot is happening, Nick, but it's not joined up enough, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, and that's obviously, Marion, is the is a challenge to the entire industry and, and going beyond the industry, right? To actually to, to make this this intent of collaborative innovation really, really real. Yeah. Um I, I, I'm conscious we're at time. Um I've been told to stick strictly to the 45 minutes. So um some very, really, you know, very powerful points. Marion, would you like to to close uh, this session and maybe uh, James uh, James can uh, can then see us out? I'm conscious of time and conscious of other people have got other things to do, but I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for joining um and and urge all of our customers, all of our, our colleagues. To, as, as to use sort of Tony's word, to step forward and be part of this. You know, I'm here, um, available to James and his team. Um, I think this is all about collaboration. It's all about trust. And it's all about keeping track of that market as it moves forward. I'm doing that by working together. Marion, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all of the rest of the panel. Uh, Nick, in particular, you've done a terrific job of keeping us to the bank's 45 nomenclature as we are exactly at 45 minutes. Um, to to Marion's last point there, this is the beginning of the conversation. Uh, this is certainly not the end. It's not conclusive. Uh, this will continue to evolve. Uh, and therefore, really, we want to be here to Marion's last offer um, to support our clients, to support our other partners in this very broad, very, very exciting ecosystem system um, that continues to become even more fascinating, particularly as we uh, as we look to exit the pandemic, not just in the UK, but, but more broadly and globally. Um, so with that, I will thank you all uh, for joining. Uh, please do get, get in contact with your relationship bankers uh, as you see fit. Uh, and we will look forward to catching up with you for the third uh, in this series as we move through the Banks 45 webinar series. So thank you all and have a very good rest of your day. Bye bye. <laughs>